I knew pretty early on when I was in PA school, actually, I resonated with a lot of the um, work that my faculty members were doing at that time. I liked the idea of giving a, you know, concise talk that was meaningful, that had pertinent information. Um, I liked the idea of teaching. Professor Jensen in. Screen keeps loading. Okay, here we go. We have Professor Charles Jensen today. All right, guys. Hi, Professor Jensen. Hello, y'all can just call me Taylor. Okay, hi Taylor. Thank you so much for coming on, coming on as a guest on eShadowing. Um, you all already know me, I'm Brodalyn. I'm the host for eShadowing for pre-PAs. And today we have Taylor Jensen, who is an assistant professor at Wake Forest University's PA program, one of the top PA programs in the country. And he has experience in ophthalmology and around LGBTQ health. So excited to learn about his journey and the work that he does both clinically and academically. So thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome. So we'll jump right into it. We always like to get started with um, learning more about your journey, how you came into like the PA profession, how you learned about PA, your why PA, and how you, you know, went about applying to PA school and patient care hours and that whole process. Awesome. Yeah. So I have a journey to PA that is probably different from a lot of you all that are on the call, but was definitely more common um, a few years ago before the PA profession gained so much traction. I actually didn't know that I wanted to be a PA when I was in high school. I didn't know when I was in college. I knew that I wanted to do something in healthcare, but I didn't know exactly what profession that would land me in. Um, I had some uh, patient care experience. I worked as an ophthalmic technician all through undergrad. Then for a year or two after school, still not knowing what I wanted to do, but knew I wanted to be in healthcare. I um, went on to get a master's degree before PA school in human physiology from NC State. And it was actually while I was at NC State that I was working as a medical assistant in urgent care, um, actually at FastMed Urgent Cares, which is uh, coming to be more of a national chain. There's locations, I believe, in a few states now, and it was a PA-founded urgent care, um, employees primarily PAs. And that is when I first became introduced to the profession, aside from some sick visits of my own growing up, um, not really knowing that I was seeing a PA probably when I saw one. And it was at that moment that I realized that I would have the, um, the work-life balance that I wanted if I created that for myself in terms of what my specialty could be, um, what my location would be in terms of where to complete my schooling and where to work because I wouldn't have those same obligations of relocation for residency and fellowship. I also discovered that I could do everything as a PA um, that I would want to do in any other healthcare profession, which is work with patients, have meaningful conversations, um, improve quality of life, and help people on the likely worst day of their life, which is what I've almost always done clinically in orthopedics. Very seldomly are people having a good day if they see me in orthopedics. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my journey. It was roundabout. Um, and I think it just goes to show that regardless of what your degree program is, what your past experiences are, I mean, ophthalmology, there's very few PAs that work in ophthalmology, regardless of what your pathway is, there is um, always opportunity for you to have a meaningful application um, to PA school. Um, right. So uh, can you tell us about the whole like application process for PA school at the time when you applied? Yeah, so I must admit that um, I have not dove into CASPA since I applied to PA school. 
And so specific granular questions about CASPA, I am not the right person. Um, but the process at the time that I applied was um, complex, at least for me. I discovered pretty early on, as I'm sure most of you all have, that each university or program has slightly different requirements in terms of which prereqs are required, and then also when those prereqs might expire, so to speak. Um, and so because my journey was somewhat non-traditional, actually, I've always been a spreadsheet uh, geek. I created a spreadsheet of all the universities that I fit the prerequisites into, which I recommend you do if you find yourself in a similar position so that you're putting the best um, use of your money towards applications because they are expensive um, to make sure that you meet the qualifications um, in and out for each school you're applying to. Got it, got it. Where did you go to PA school? Yeah, so I, I don't think I said, I went to Wake Forest for PA school. Oh, oh okay, so it was like a full circle moment. So you went to Wake Forest and, um, for PA school and now you're teaching at Wake Forest. Correct. Yep. Full circle moment. I um, I set my sights on Wake Forest, not knowing if it was realistic, but putting my best foot forward and loved my time there um, so much so that I have come back to be a part of it on the other end. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I read that, you know, initially you were just like a guest lecturer. So what made you then want to transition to basically like full time um, professor? So I... Um, I knew pretty early on when I was in PA school, actually, I resonated with a lot of the um, work that my faculty members were doing at that time. I liked the idea of giving a you know concise talk that was meaningful, that had pertinent information. Um, I liked the idea of teaching you know, laboratory type classes. I've always traditionally been a pretty good communicator and that is something that you absolutely must be in order to be a successful educator as well. And um, I don't know, I, I just saw myself, you know, in the future and uh, the shoes of my faculty members at that time. And I just started guest lecturing um, when I was asked on topics that um, were pertinent to either my past medical experience or current practice. And when a position became available, I applied and it's not a very dramatic story. I just kept my foot in the door and kept doing what I liked. And um, yeah, it worked out. That's great. That's great. And for all of you guys that want to get into Wake Forest, like word on the street is that he's an amazing professor. <laughs> <laughs> we posted you on, you know, about e shadowing the students in the PA class. We're like, oh my gosh, she's amazing. You know, he's going to be great. So I'm like, yay. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. I didn't know where it was getting, um, like where the invite for this was going to be sent, but I had a few of uh, the students today come up to me and said that they had shared some link on their personal social media pages. And I was like, oh man, okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah they found you. <laughs> yeah, they were really excited for that. Um, so that's great. So um, so you got into pay school, you're at Wake Forest, you like them top PA program, how was, you know, just that transition going from, you know, just kind of being an undergrad or non-traditional for you and then having to learn in a whole new style of learning and the fast paced nature of PA school. How did you basically survive and, you know, learn in PA school? Like what advice would you give to the students for when they start? Sure. Yeah. So um, I think regardless of where you go to PA school, and all PA schools are fantastic, they're all accredited by the same body and meet the same standards. Um, so I appreciate the compliments for Wake Forest, but ARC PA does a great job in making sure that all accredited PA, program, PA programs are meeting the correct standards. Um, it's definitely adjustment studying for PA school. It's unlike anything that I think most students have ever experienced before, especially if you're going to a program that has some small group learning component where you're learning with your peers more so than just from a lecture-based format. Um, I would say the learning has an additional pressure to it in a way because it's not just learning to get a good grade on a test, it's learning so that you can care for another human being in the future. The stakes are much higher than a GPA point. It's someone else's life on the other line of your learning. So that puts you into a different mindset. Um, and I would say the way that my studying and learning really shifted is I focused more on being able to understand a disease process from start to finish 
meaning that I understood what normal anatomy is, what abnormal anatomy or abnormal physiology or pathophysiology, as we call it, is for that disease state. And then using that basic science understanding of what's going wrong to then um, be able to fill in the blanks of, well, how would this show up in a patient? What would it look like on physical exam? What might they complain of when they come in, you know, for their visit? And then what medications, if it's something that can be treated with a medication, would reverse or do the opposite of what that physiological process is. So I tried to think of it more of not just memorizing facts, but trying to understand a process. Because if you're able to understand the background of why something is happening, it makes the treatment and how to recognize it so much more intuitive as opposed to just memorizing facts. Thank you so much for that. Um, so before we move on, we have some questions um, coming in. Uh, one question is about your um, the application. How long did it take for you to apply to pay school after you did research? Um, it was a pretty quick turnaround for me because I was a non-traditional path. I started working at the urgent care realized that it wasn't an accident that I ended up in that urgent care, that it was actually kind of a calling of what I should do. Um, and so I really buckled down at the time I was navigating, getting my other's ma other master's degree at the time. And I would say in the course of like two or three months, I had gone through um, every program profile that I thought that I could fit into either from a geographical or cost perspective and had narrowed down the schools that I wanted to apply to. Um, I will say that I took a more conservative approach to the schools that I applied to, meaning that I was already a student on student loans at the time and I was very um, selective in which schools I applied to because I could not afford to apply to a lot of schools. Um, very fortunately that panned out for me okay in the end um, but all the more reason like we talked about earlier to make sure that you fit the requirements of the program that you're applying to um, very well so that you don't um, spend unnecessary money right. thank, you. thank you and any suggestions for interviewing for interviewing like how to do well in a PA school interview right correct yeah um, so each university is going to interview slightly differently. Some will do panel interviews um, where there's multiple people interviewing you at once. Some will do group interviews where you have multiple candidates meeting with you um, and one or two interviewers. And so that'll vary a lot. I will say more than anything um, is to be authentic. Um, if things are overly rehearsed and we can't see the true you, um, then it's hard to say, you know, would you really be a good fit for the program or profession if everything is so rehearsed? Um, I'm not telling you not to rehearse in practice because you should. You should be confident on how to answer like key interview questions, but make sure that you let your, um, your passion your interest and your authentic self come through in your interviews. Cause at the end of the day, that's who you're going to be in a patient care room. Right, right. Great, great response. Okay. So we're going to, we'll answer some more questions later guys. So we're going to move on to talking more about like clinicals, like clinical year. And um, can you tell us more about that? Like what was your favorite rotation, least favorite, um, an experience that you had during clinicals? Um, is that, well, we'll actually talk about your then career path after. Okay. Can you share your rotate, how your rotations were? Yeah. Um, so I had 10 core rotations. That's just the way it broke down at Wake Forest. They were a little over four weeks for each rotation. Um, Wake Forest is a 24 month program with very little to no breaks um, to keep it in that 24 month time frame. Um, and so rotations are maybe a bit shorter. Some other programs will have five or six week rotations um, occasionally. But at my 10 core rotations, I had three electives that I got to choose out of those 10. My three electives that I chose were cardiology, um, critical care, and orthopedic trauma. Um, it turns out that um, I went into clinical year thinking that I didn't wanna be a 
hands-on procedure-based provider. I thought that was going to want to be a medication management, interpreting diagnostics, um, kind of hands-off, not procedure-based PA, and complete 180 on my clinical rotations. I enjoyed my cardiology rotation. I learned a lot, but I realized that bedside procedures, um, treatment in the ER um, were much more my interest. And so my coolest thing that happened on my clinical year is I actually got my first job um, from one of my clinical rotations. My second to last rotation was in orthopedic trauma um, with a group in Asheville, North Carolina. And I had my four weeks rotation. And at the end, they said they had a position and asked me if I wanted to apply. And so that was the coolest thing that happened is I got my first job um, as a result of my rotations. I will say that my life in clinical year was very different from didactic year in that um, I was still learning just as much or arguably maybe more than I did in didactic year. But I was learning through seeing everything that I had learned about in a textbook or on a lecture slide or in a small group discussion and a real human. And that made the connections so much more meaningful to be able to retain information. Um, but because you're going from month to month through so many different rotations and, and different um, specialties in medicine that operate on different schedules, I was all over the place in terms of night shifts, day shifts, Monday through Friday, weekends. Um, so I had to make sure that I kind of like pre-warned my support system, my spouse, my family, that I'm going to be all over the place for the next year and catch me when you can. Let me know if you need anything. So um, you got that the job was so that was your first job outside of PA school in orthopedics. So how was that? So you, um, you finished rotations, you graduated, passed the pants, and you know now you're starting you know the first job. How was that like learning curve and adjusting to like new grad life and especially the support that you got you know in training in ortho trauma? Um, it was it was challenging. Um, I don't want to <laughs> sugarcoat it, Ronald, and I'm sure that you probably had a similar learning curve when you first start practice. Yeah. And you I have, have <laughs> Oh, yeah. So you have such great foundational knowledge. Um, but when you actually start to implement it into clinical practice, like I remember my first um, day while I was still onboarding um, and, you know, working alongside another PA on the team. I put in an order into the EMR system for Tylenol and I was like, oh my God, can I actually give the patient Tylenol? Did I give them too much Tylenol? Do they have liver damage? Are they going to be okay? And so it's this whole other frame of mind to realizing that you're the final decision maker. Um, and so that was the biggest thing from a confidence standpoint was um, feeling confident in my decisions and recognizing more than when I knew something, recognizing when I did not know something and knowing when to go to look something up or go to ask a mentor for advice. Um, I found in orthopedic trauma that my learning curve was pretty steep because we would cover in PA school, you know, the basics of musculoskeletal system, but the types of fractures and um, disease processes, traumatic injuries that I was caring for is not something that was covered in PA school. Um, and so I spent, if I'm being really honest with myself, I would say that it probably took somewhere between eight to nine months into full-time clinical work before I reached a point of, um, I feel really confident in what I do know and see all the time. And I'm still learning every day and I'm anxious about the things that I don't recognize, but I'm pretty firm in knowing what I I don't know and when I need to seek help. Um, so it was about eight to nine months of like this steep learning curve before I started to not plateau, but the curve went from this to this. <laughs> right, right. And what was like a day in the life like in ortho? So I was solely um, inpatient at a uh, level two trauma center. Um, it's now level one and it's the only trauma center in Western North Carolina. And so we received all of the traumatic injuries from that part of the state. 
And um, so I was inpatient. I was 12 hour shifts, which um, realistically are 13 hour shifts by the time you hand off to the next provider and finish up your charting. Um, my primarily responsibilities were I would take all call um, for traumatic orthopedic injuries from the ER. Um, we were a team of five surgeons and seven PAs. And so the PAs did all of the trauma consultation and stabilization in the ER um, while our attending uh, traumatologist surgeons stayed primarily in the operating room. So we would stabilize the patient, get the necessary workup, and then get them to the operating room for the surgeon to fix. Um, so I love that. Like that's true collaboration. Like that's awesome. Yeah. So lots of independent um, practice in the ER setting. Definitely was practicing at the top of my license there. So consultations for orthopedic trauma um, would be definitely open fractures. Um, for those of you all that don't know, open fracture means fracture that is coming out of the skin or has come out of the skin and went back under. Um, big risk for infection and soft tissue injury. Other common things would be pelvic fractures. Um, there's lots of blood vessels and nerves in the pelvis. And so when a pelvis is fractured, it's a big deal. Um, and then any type of infection or major soft tissue injury. So if someone was in a motor vehicle collision and had significant soft tissue loss from, you know, uh, road rash from, you know, asphalt, if it was motorcycle or from some component of the vehicle where they lost a lot of soft tissue, that would also be orthopedic trauma. So I did a lot of reductions, meaning putting bones back into alignment um, with the help of my EDPAs to give me some conscious sedation so that I could have the patient comfortable to be able to manipulate their bones and joints back into alignment. Um, did a lot of cleaning, so um, irrigating dirty wounds, getting them wrapped up and washed out to go to the OR. And then I would actually put patients in traction as well. So um, traction is where you put a pen through the skin to be able to hold a fracture out to length if it's at risk of damaging a artery or nerve. Um, and then I would do some um, call for the floors as well. So after our trauma patients had been through surgery, if they needed anything on the floor, uh, medications, orders, I would do that sort of thing as well. That was a long answer to a short question. I'm sorry. Everyone. No, that was great. Um, how long did you do orthopedics for? Um, so I did, yeah, so I did it full time for two and a half years okay. um, before I transitioned to part time when I took on a faculty role. Okay, okay, cool. So now I just um, part time. And so you're a full time faculty. I know that you guys have like the different days, like clinical days mm -hmm. and all that too. Okay, are awesome. So now how is your life as a faculty, you know, member and professor? <laughs> oh, man. Um, so it's different. Um, Shift-based work as a full-time PA um, is very rewarding in that you typically work a less number of days, but your days are much longer. So I would always tell people there's not much life that happens outside of a 12 or 13 hour shift. Most of the time when that shift is over, you come home and take care of yourself from a nutrition and sleep perspective, and then you go back and do it again, as opposed to faculty or if you work a more traditional eight to five office type job, there's a lot of life that still happens outside of those working hours. There's still time to meet up with friends or family, you know, go exercise, go to the grocery store, make dinner, those sort of things. Um, so I've really enjoyed not being shift-based. Um, I like the more traditional schedule. Um, I will say that um, my PA students, I get very attached to them and I want what's best for them. And so it ends up being that I'm not on call for patients. Um, all the time anymore, but I'm always on call for my students to make sure that they're okay. Um, and so that part of it hasn't changed. I always have that um, uh, lingering sense of responsibility, which is good. Um, being, feeling responsible for your patients or your students is what makes you a good provider. That's why they love you. That's why they were so <laughs> happy when they saw you're gonna do e shadowing. <laughs> so we're, we have some more questions. Yeah. Um, 
do you recommend taking a gap year to get more direct patient care hours? I recommend you making sure that you're confident in the amount of hours that you've accrued um, and making sure that it meets the average um, hours or higher for the programs that you're applying to, um, making sure that your application is strong going in. Mm -hmm. There are definitely applicants to PA school that during the course of their undergraduate, they've been able to somehow juggle um, obtaining a bachelor's degree and prerequisites and also accrue an impressive amount of healthcare hours. In that situation, I don't know that there's benefit from a gap year. But what I will say is always make sure in your applications that you apply at a time that you are putting your absolute best foot forward in terms of hours, GPA, which is not all about grades, but hours, grades, experiences to make sure that your application is ro as robust and as full as possible. And if that means that you need to take a year or two to make that happen, do it. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay, we have good question. What's one of the craziest injuries you saw working in a level two trauma center? So I get this question all the time and whoever asked this question, I promise I'm not picking on you. Um, <laughs> and Rodalyn, you may agree with this as well. Oftentimes the craziest things that I've cared for in the ER or trauma-based setting don't necessarily have the most impressive um, presentation in terms of some crazy fracture. It's the story or the patient behind that injury, um, whether they come from a walk of life that has led them you know, down a, a path of having some healthcare disparity or some poor outcome of their health and being able to make a meaningful change for that patient and either giving them back mobility or giving them back some quality of life are the craziest and most rewarding stories like in my heart and the reason why I keep doing what I'm doing. I know that's not the answer you wanted for that question, but that's that's the real answer. Um, I would say probably the most um, complex injuries that I saw and every time I saw it on the X-ray or CT scan and I was like, oh my gosh, this is really, really bad would be um, pelvic injuries. Um, specifically pelvic injuries where they have a significant impact to the front of their pelvis and it causes the two hemispheres of the pelvis to separate. So it'll separate from where it attaches to the sacrum in the back and then that cartilaginous connection in the front. And so they essentially have a floating pelvis on both sides. Um, very, very serious injury and absolutely make sure your heart skip a beat when you see it on imaging and you know, you know, what lies ahead for that patient in terms of surgery and rehabilitation. Oh my goodness. Yes. Oh, wow. And I'm guessing those are usually just terrible car accidents. Terrible car accidents. Um, most of the time, um, car accidents without a seatbelt. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So click it or ticket or have a bad pelvic injury. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so um, a similar question is, um, what are three most common procedures in ortho or top three medications? I'm thinking pain medications. <laughs> but, yeah, what are three common procedures that you, or surgeries that you guys perform? I know pelvic, you said, but what are some other ones? Yeah, so I would say in orthopedics in general, probably one of the most common procedures that is done is some type of hip replacement either for severe arthritis or from having a fracture or a break to the top of the femur where it goes into the pelvis socket. Um, other common orthopedic surgeries are gonna be any type of joint replacement. So knee replacement, shoulder replacement. Those are not traumatic, but those are the most common probably orthopedic surgeries. Um, from a trauma perspective, definitely the most common fractures that we fixed with surgery would be plate and screws for some type of wrist fracture. So um, we call them foosh injuries, but fall on outstretched hands. So when you fall and you catch yourself like this, um, it breaks almost all the time, your radius um, on one side and that requires surgery. Um, most common medication, so funny story, when I was in PA school my first year, I was like, man, I don't want to go into a specialty where I have to prescribe pain medications because I don't like pain medications. 
Also, antibiotics are really confusing. I don't want to have to prescribe antibiotics. And then blood thinners scare me because I don't want to make a patient bleed. And unfortunately, those are the three most common medications in orthopedics. Yes, yes. Author, especially like post-surgery with like, you know, blood thinners so they don't get a, a blood clot. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So antibiotics, anticoagulation, and then pain medications are the most common medicines in orthopedics. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and did you, so you didn't at all work in ophthalmology as a PA? This was just pre-PA? Yeah. Um, I wish that I was one of the few PAs in the country that worked in ophthalmology because it's such a cool field. But no, all of my um, experience in ophthalmology is before I was a PA. But that means that I teach all of the ophthalmology stuff at the school. Okay. So a student wants to know, um, the procedures that you perform solely, like you did say, you know, um, reductions. And can you describe the scope of your the procedures that you do? So, um, sure. as a school provider. Yeah. So, um, I did not first assist in surgery. That is very common in orthopedics to have a PA be first assist in surgery, meaning that you're standing next to the surgeon and participating actively in the surgery in terms of you know, fracture fixation, um, sterile procedures. Most of the time the PA does all of the wound closure and a lot of the opening as well, in terms of getting down to the surgical site. Um, very common in ortho, I did not do that um, because I was mostly ER based or consult based. Most common procedures I did would be what's called a closed reduction, which means that under sedation from our wonderful ER providers, I would manipulate the patient's fracture or bone. If it's a fracture, if it's a dislocated joint, um, I would use reduction techniques, which you develop over time and through reading to manipulate the bones back into anatomical position or normal positioning. Uh, most of the time during these procedures, um, what I mean when I say conscious sedation is that the patient's been given um, both a relaxant and a pain suppressant such that they're still able to breathe on their own, um, but they are pain controlled and relaxed enough that I'm able to manipulate um, their bones back into alignment. That was definitely the most common procedure I did for things like wrists um, and ankles and hips, um, hip dislocations. Um, the procedure I was talking about with the pen is called a Steinman pen. I don't know who Steinman is, whoever developed the pen, I guess. Um, and that is where you use a drill, um, a medical surgical drill, to drill through the end of the femur or the top of the tibia. So either the bone right at the end before the knee joint or the bone right below the knee at the top. And you would drill through the bone um, and be able to apply through a pulley system, essentially weight um, off the end of the bed to pull the bone back into alignment. Um, this was most commonly done for femur fractures, so thigh bone fractures. There's a lot of really important blood vessels and nerves that run right along the femur. And so you wanna make sure that the femur is in good alignment and not way out of position or it runs the risk of damaging those nerves or blood vessels. Um, and then finally was just um, what we would call an irrigation and debridement. So washing out with lots of sterile fluid, gravel, grass, metal car parts out of open wounds. Okay, so, and I, this was a question I was curious, because you said um, there were five surgeons. So how was it like working with five surgeons, five different personalities? So can you tell us more about that? Or were you just assigned one or were you with just all five? I was with all five. Um, and if anyone has ever worked with surgical specialties before, um, each surgeon typically has a very refined list of what they do and do not like in terms of the care of their patients. Um, so it was a learning curve. And I've learned from my PA mentors on my team, the ones that have been there for years. Um, they are your keys, the practicing PAs when you first start practicing to figure out the ins and outs of wherever you are working. So they were huge in helping me figure out you know, what certain surgeons did and did not like. The other thing, um, which comes back to the PA school interview, is being authentic. Um, so 
acknowledging what you don't know, not being afraid to ask for help. And um, I had always found that within reason, um, I would never get any negative pushback for asking a question as opposed to making an assumption and then making a mistake. So it can be scary to ask a question sometimes, but remember you're not asking a question for your own sake or for your own ego, you're asking it for the patient's betterment. So once you think about it that way, ask questions all the time, that's how you learn. Yes, yes, thank you so much for that. Okay, um, so in terms of uh, teaching, what is your favorite course or subject? Is it ortho or is it something else? <laughs> So I like ortho. I like teaching ortho stuff. Um, my favorite information to teach is at Wake Forest. We have a one of our core classes. It's called Being a PA. And in that course, it is a essentially a year-long exploration into softer issues in medicine. So it's where we do a deep dive into exploring the different identities and backgrounds of our patients. So we do an exploration into like today, I give a, um, a session on LGBTQIA health and how to communicate with those patients, um, just providing information and background for students who may not be familiar um, with that terminology or with what that means. We also dive into race, um, ethnicity, religion, spirituality, death and dying, disability status, um, how to communicate with our patients, I know it seems natural that we would all be good communicators and we are, but there are definitely techniques of different types of question framework to ask, um, how to build rapport with our patients very quickly and efficiently. If any of you all have ever been to a healthcare provider in the past and been like, wow, they were a great provider. Um, you felt like they were in the room with you for 45 minutes, but really they were only in there for 12 minutes and you thought that they were the best thing ever. It's because they learned how to efficiently manage their time and manage um, their relationship center communication with patients to be able to build rapport and trust quickly. Um, and so I teach, I teach in that course, I teach a lot of those different sessions, um, relying also on support from our local community from experts in those fields to come and assist me with those topics and lead sessions, um, you know, as we explore how to care for the patient as a whole, you know, you can figure out how to cure an illness or to treat a disorder, but if you can't communicate or reach the patient that's in front of you and identify with them, then that's only half of the battle. Yes, yes, I love that. I love, love, love that. And I always tell students that as well. And it's so, so, so important to just be able to, you know, communicate with the patient and build that rapport, as you said. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, of course. Okay, okay. okay so um, what, we'll answer one more question and then move on to um, let Taylor uh, take over for the case study. Okay. So, um, what advice would you give students in regards to keeping their sanity with the influx of information learning and flash learning that happens in PA school? What are some things that you do? So um, I also talk about this a lot in that same course, but it's the concept of self-care. And so acknowledging that whatever you do now to take the best care of yourself in terms of both your physical and mental health, that it's not something that you can put on the back burner while you're in PA school. Yes, you have a lot of information to learn. Medicine is a lot to acquire. But if you are not fueling your body through adequate sleep, adequate nutrition, adequate exercise, and exercise, I don't mean going to CrossFit unless that's what you do normally, but getting outside, going for a walk, meeting up with friends or family, like you have to do these things. And I've I see someone commented CrossFit, um, but you have to make time to be able to care for yourself as a whole. Because if you are not caring for your body, then your body cannot physically retain all of the information you're expected to learn. Um, so I encourage students to think about PA school as being a full-time job and a half, probably. Um, it's probably more than a full-time job, but to plan out their days so that they're allotting time for breaks for eating, preparing food, calling a family member, friend, 
um, staying in touch with, you know, their support system and caring for themselves as a whole. Um, same like we just talked about for our patient. Yes, we can treat them with medicines and surgeries and therapies. Um, but if we're not reaching them as an individual, then we're not doing our job. Same thing for you. You have to care for your total body where you can't retain all the information. Okay, perfect. Very true. Thank you so much. So yeah. I to let, so I'm going to let Taylor take over and present the patient case study. I'm not sure if you have a PowerPoint or you're going to just walk through whatever you want. Um, just going to let you teach the students. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, so I'm going to try to share my screen here in just a second and try not to share with you all everything else I've pulled up on my desktop. All right, here we go. <laughs> Okay, are you all able to see this? I can see Perfect. It. Um, My faculty education experience has done one thing. I can at least share a screen efficiently. So case study and orthopedic trauma. So general scenario to kind of set the scene. So a 28-year-old male presents to a level one trauma center following a head-on MVC, which stands for motor vehicle collision, with prolonged extrication. Prolonged extrication, meaning it took a while for rescuers to be able to get the patient out of the vehicle or out of the situation that they were stuck in. Um, so with prolonged extrication of approximately 1.5 hours, patient was noted to be alert and oriented in the field. Um, so wherever they were prior to being transported, and they remained stable until presentation in the emergency room. The patient was placed into a traction splint for a notable deformity to the right tibia, so your tibia is your shin, um, with significant swelling. On presentation in the ER, when you see them, um, the patient is in 10 out of 10 pain to the right lower extremity with significant emotion and vocal response to this pain. So I've included a picture here on the side of what the stabilization um, of attraction splint might look like when a patient comes in off of the ambulance to the emergency department. Ronalyn is having like flashbacks to work right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right. So step one, the idea of what is on your differential. So when I say differential, I mean, what is a potential cause for why this patient is having a deformity to the right leg and why they're having pain? So do they have the ability to unmute or can they put in the chat what they what they put, think could be wrong? Yeah, they can they they can unmute as well, but they can put their responses in the chat. Okay. So for differentials. Somebody said femur fracture. Okay. Yep. So fracture. Probably not the femur if it's the shin bone, because you have your tibia and fibula. Femur is your thigh. But yep, so tibial fracture. Tibia fracture. Yeah. What else besides a fracture could be causing this? What else? What else is in that area? Brain. Yeah. So exactly. So thinking about soft tissue that we have in there, we have muscles, we have tendons, ligaments um, that can all be injured. Um, so we've talked about muscles, tendons, ligaments, bones. What else is along our uh, extremities? Ooh, anterior tibialis. This person works in ortho. I like that. Keep going. <laughs> um, let's see. Any other comments, guys? Just reading them out. That's okay. So hematoma, exactly. So we have blood vessels. Blood vessels can be damaged and they can bleed, causing things like hematoma. Perfect. All right. So some history. So you have some general ideas that come immediately to your mind of what could be going on with this patient. So you have the opportunity because this patient is alert and oriented, meaning they know where they are and what's happened. You have the opportunity to ask them some questions. Granted, they are in 10 out of 10 pain and having a significant emotional response. So you want to make sure that you're making the best use of their time and their discomfort. What questions do you absolutely need to ask before you can do anything for this patient? Any ideas? Yeah, where's the pain coming from? Does it radiate? I love that. Yes, where's the most intense pain located? Can they tell you exactly where it hurts the most? I love that. What else? 
what level of pain? Ooh, yes, good. Allergies to medications, very likely in the near future, this patient is gonna get a medicine of some sort from you. Is there anything that they can't have? Numbness or tingling, amazing, yeah. If someone had a deformity, that means that something moved out of position. So do they, have they lost, have they had nerve damage? Um, describe the pain. Yeah. Can they say it's sharp? Is it dull? Is it, um, trying to think of how it's like a stabbing knife type pain. Um, is there anything that makes the pain worse or better? I love that. How long is the pain? Blood thinners. Yes, absolutely. We need to know if this patient that has a deformity, if they have a risk of having bleeding, any medications they're taking. Yeah. So y'all are all on the right track. You're kind of eliminating risk. You're getting the most pertinent information and making sure you're not going to do more harm when you give them um, some type of medication. Um, any idea? So you're in the emergency department. You have all of these resources. What else, aside from you being the provider, do you need um, to be able to care for this patient? Is there any other healthcare teams that need to be involved? X-ray. Absolutely. We need some pictures. I think that's a great place to start. Good. Y'all are doing amazing. This is great. So initial thoughts that I have at this point. Sorry, my PowerPoint's being a little slow. So initial thoughts, um, you want to make sure that you clarify the incident and the mechanism of injury. So you want to know exactly where they were sitting in the car. Were they driving? Were they a passenger? Did they have on a seatbelt? You want to evaluate the quality of pain, which we talked about already. Um, we want to know for any medical conditions or allergies like we talked about. And then we want to know if there's any other related symptoms. So numbness, temperature changes, anything else that's going on associated with this. So you all did an amazing job. You identified all of those things. I um, also see people talking about social work and rehabilitation. Absolutely. Um, maybe a little bit early at this point to get those teams involved, but undoubtedly a patient is going to need some type of rehabilitation and social work help after an orthopedic injury. Great job. Okay. So physical exam. So now you've got your basic history. What physical exam can you do with your hands or with basic instruments to be able to evaluate the patient to see what is going on? What do you think you should do? Palpation. Yes, good word. So you're going to palpate the area. You want to see what it feels like. Can you feel any deformity? Can you press on those soft tissues? Are they squishy like they used to should be, or are they full of blood like a hematoma? Neurovascular checks, perfect. So yes, yeah, so you're gonna assess for pulse. You're gonna assess for sensation. Um, can you feel me touching your toes? Reflex check, um, yes, sometimes. Um, depending on how unstable a patient's um, leg is, you may not want to um, initiate an involuntary reflex and cause them to move a muscle or a bone that could be damaged. Um, but absolutely, you want to assess for movements. You want to see, can they wiggle their toes? Can they move their ankle up and down? Range of motion. Perfect. Um, so good. So you've assessed cr uh, critical things in orthopedics. You've palpated. You've inspected. You've checked for vascular status through pulses. You've looked at the nerves um, through sensation and through asking them to do range of motion. What labs or what images should you order at this point? Nice. Tib, fib, anterior and posterior views. Nice. Come work with me for the day. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're going to want to get a tibia and fibula x-ray, absolutely. Depending on what you uncovered when you were palpating, sometimes we'll get an x-ray above and below an injury, so a joint above and a joint below. Um, the reason for this is this patient was in a motor vehicle collision. They were likely traveling at a high rate of speed, meaning that they went from whatever speed they were at to zero miles per hour very quickly. That's a lot of force. If it was enough force to break a bone, there is likelihood that there was enough force somewhere else 
you know, on that same extremity that you should probably look above and below to make sure that you're not missing anything. Um, we call this in the ER a distracting injury. So we know that the tibia has a deformity. Um, we can't focus all of our energy there because if we just focus on that, we may miss something else. We don't want to let it distract us. So I see people commenting maybe CT depending on fracture. Absolutely. So a CT scan um, is a more advanced imaging um, that allows us to see in a three-dimensional plane what um, is wrong with the patient's um, bones. So complete metabolic panel. I love that. Um, what all is in a metabolic panel? Why do we want that? Potassium is in a metabolic panel. You're correct. So blood levels and H and H hemoglobin and hematocrit is not in a metabolic panel. That would be in a complete blood count. But I love that you mentioned that you do want to know if the patient has lost a lot of blood. And you would see that in a decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit. Magnesium is actually not in a metabolic panel. That is an addition to a metabolic panel, but I like what you're framing it as. So metabolic panel is going to have your electrolytes in it. Things like calcium, sodium, potassium. Um, yep, Na, so sodium. It's also going to have your kidney function. So things like creatinine um, that lets us know how our body is processing, um, you know, fluids in terms of making urine. Um, also a complete metabolic panel will let you know if there's been any liver um, elevation. So are they having liver damage? Exactly, liver function. So those are the key things that you get. It's a great idea to get one of these because if someone has had, you know, a liver injury or lost a lot of blood, um, they could very quickly have um, alterations in their electrolytes or in their kidney function. And then blood counts, complete blood count we mentioned with hemoglobin, hematocrit, have they lost a lot of blood? Um, sometimes this can be confusing for students because your hemoglobin and hematocrit can go down even if the patient doesn't have blood on the bed sheets. If you have bleeding that is inside, so if you're losing blood, not in your blood vessels, now it's accumulating in a space inside your body it shouldn't be. Really great thoughts. All right, so next steps. So we have gotten our physical exam and we've done our orders. So you have done your due diligence, you've assessed for, oh, typo, assessed for wounds for open fracture sites, um, you've assessed perfusion and pulses. You've assessed sensation. You've assessed muscular compression. You've assessed for temperature. And then you've already had started to investigate your distracting injury to make sure you're not missing anything else. So I've included here, and Rodalyn, and likely some of you all are going to know what direction this is going now, this neurovascular assessment that we call the five Ps. And so what the five Ps are is those are pain, pulse, pallor, paresthesias, and paralysis. So the reason that we investigate this, someone who's having severe pain has a tibia deformity, even though we don't know if it's broken yet. If they have any of these things, we start to get worried about one particular emergency, both in the emergency department and in orthopedics. Anybody have any idea what the five Ps tells us or what it makes us worried for? Emergency. This is a hard one. This is a more challenging case study. I thought about doing an ankle sprain and I was like, no, they can handle this. <laughs> They've been great so far though. I'm really impressed. Somebody said DVT, not quite, but like, uh, but I'm yeah. super impressed with all your responses though. Yeah, so y'all are definitely on the right category or right territory. So you're thinking about neurological damage, which this does necrosis, which this process also can lead to. Really close. Compartment syndrome, look at you. Yes. Yes, Tara. Oh They're my correct. So at, the, does ortho or something like that. <laughs> so absolutely right. So the five Ps are your warning signs for early to late stage compartment syndrome. So we'll talk a little bit about what compartment syndrome is, but your assessment for this, you're assessing for pain. So they're going to have uncontrolled pain. Um, once you get some experience, you know when you see patients that fractures hurt, 
But fractures generally get more comfortable even before they're fixed once you have them immobilized so that they can't move it. It's still a six, seven, eight out of 10, but it's not 10 out of 10 screaming pain most of the time. Um, also, you wanna assess for pulses. We'll talk about compartment syndrome in a minute, but patients can very quickly lose blood flow to their extremities. So you wanna know, do they still have blood flow? Pallor, meaning that if they are having this process and they've lost a pulse, their skin is going to change colors, meaning it's not going to be warm. It's not going to have that same perfusion, meaning blood flow is getting all the way down to the extremities. Paresthesias is a fancy word for numbness. Um, Roughly, there's some more nuance to that, but we'll say numbness for the purposes of this talk. So paresthesias, they may have some alteration in what their sensation feels like because they're having this neurovascular damage. And then paralysis, meaning they can't move their toes. They've had nerve damage. They've had loss of blood flow. So um, reading through your comments real quick. Tara does physical therapy. Oh, does physical therapy. Oh, so I'm sure a physical therapist has seen a compartment syndrome in recovery at some point or another. Absolutely. All right. So findings. You got back your x-ray. So um, here's your x-ray of your tibia. What does everyone see? Fracture. Absolutely. Yep, mid shaft tibia fracture. What is this tinier bone over here on the side? What is that bone called? Fibula, absolutely. And actually, if you look all the way down, so you see right above the ankle at the bottom of the screen, do you see that tiny little fragment right there at the end of the fibula? Yep, so they actually have a distal fibula fracture, very good. So this is a great example of if there was enough force from that injury to break the tibia, which is a big bone, there was enough injury that there's going to be a fracture somewhere else on that same leg. Um, it's almost impossible to break one without breaking the other, unless it's down at the ankle, which is nuance. Um, but yeah, good job. So when you pressed on the compartments, they felt tense, meaning they were tight. You couldn't mush them together and compress them like you could if you reach down and press your own calf right now. It felt like there was wood under the skin because it was so tight. And when you moved or flexed and extend their big toe, it made their pain even worse. So these are all signs pointing you towards compartment syndrome. So you kind of already figured it out, but if it wasn't compartment syndrome, let's say that you're wrong with the information that you have, you know there's a fracture, you're worried about compartment syndrome. What are some other more obscure things that could still be wrong? Anybody have any ideas? DBT, absolutely. Any other thoughts? Infection, yeah. So absolutely, these are some other more obscure things that I have on here as well, just because we want to always make sure that we're being really broad, because um, if we come to a diagnosis too quickly, then that means that we could make things that don't really seem like they fit, fit what we want it to be. So things like DVT, cellulitis, which is infection, gangrene, which is a really gnarly type of infection and necrosis type process, rhabdomyolysis, which is actually where your muscles break down, um, some type of vascular injury, so damage to an artery or vein, and then compartment syndrome. So nice job. Ooh, so evaluation for compartment syndrome. So this is an emergency. This is something that needs treatment ASAP. So whenever Rodolin sees this in the emergency department, I bet she's calling orthopedic or vascular surgery in about 35 seconds because she knows that this is not something to mess around with. Yes, definitely. So you check for compartment syndrome, doing all the things that we talked about. If they have some of these five Ps, if they have really tense compartments, that's a clinical diagnosis, meaning that we can say confidently that it's compartment syndrome without us having to have a lab test or a number to prove it. However, if we're uncertain, so meaning we're between a few things, we can also check the pressure in the compartment um, through a device like this that actually puts a needle inside of the muscle, injects a small amount of fluid and lets us know if the pressure is high. Um, so they often have high pressure in compartment syndrome because blood is filling inside of that space around that fracture site. 
you also can have muscle breakdown from compartment syndrome. So as um, the swelling continues to get worse and worse in that leg and you lose blood flow, you, use, you lose nerve sensation, um, it actually causes your muscle cells, which you're living, to die and break down and form these different components, which we can measure in a lab test. Um, and that would be like the startings of rhabdomyolysis, if you've heard of that before. Sometimes people will get rhabdo after a really intense CrossFit exercise if they've never done it before, even without a fracture. So causes, so general physiology, um, that's important to know. So acute compartment syndrome is caused by some component of increased pressure inside of your muscular compartments. So I think, I have a picture of hot dogs here, not to be weird, but to think about our muscle compartments. So our muscles are tissues that live inside of these casings, similar to hot dogs, and we call them fascia. And so whenever there's bleeding in that muscle tissue, it quickly fills up this fascial compartment like a hot dog casing. And our blood vessels and our nerves are also in these compartments. And when there's so much pressure from the bleeding, from the fracture site, from the trauma, it fills these hot dog casings or these fascial compartments with blood and cuts off blood flow. And so does anybody have any idea what we might do to treat this? So we have bleeding that's uncontrolled within these compartments. We're worried about these muscle cells dying. What can we do or what do you think orthopedics or surgery is going to do to fix this? He said fasciotomy. Oh my gosh. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So fasciotomy, that is absolutely correct. So I know we are a minute or two over time. We're almost done, I promise. Um, so recommended treatment. So you're going to do an urgent surgical consult for fasciotomy. Um, we'll talk about what that is on the next slide. You're going to make sure that you take off anything that's constricting that leg. If they have a cast, if they have a splint, if they have some tight dressings, all of that comes off. Um, you want to keep that leg elevated so that blood is flowing not down towards the toes, it's flowing back towards the heart. And you want to do everything that you can to keep them stable otherwise to make sure that their blood pressure doesn't um, go down to a point where they are crashing, so to speak, or tanking. Um, so I have a picture here. This is from a medical textbook that I use, and it shows the muscle compartments and the fascia surrounding these muscle compartments. And it has a picture here of whenever you have this swelling or bleeding within these space, how it compresses and makes everything super tight. Um, and then there's a picture here on the side of what a fasciotomy looks like. So this is done in the operating room, and there's not a lot of science to it except for you make incisions big incisions from the knee all the way down to the ankle, opening up those compartments so that the muscle can swell and have ability to come out of that space. Essentially, you can take blood, you can relieve that pressure so that blood flow is able to be restored um, and you can continue to perfuse your extremity. Um, oftentimes, after fasciotomy, patients are left with these big incisions open for several days up to a week or two to allow for swelling to go down. Um, oftentimes we'll put them in um, these specific dressings that are attached to a vacuum pump um, so that they don't get infected and so excess fluid or bleeding can be removed. So after treatment, um, fasciotomies will be closed. I didn't put a picture of an actual fasciotomy in here because I didn't know how interested everyone would be in trauma, but these are what fasciotomies look like after they've started to be closed. Um, so the bottom picture is a picture of a skin graft covering where there was a fasciotomy. And the top picture is a dermaclosed device where you can slowly turn these little dials to close the incision over time as swelling gets smaller and smaller. So in general, I've just listed some other causes of acute compartment syndrome for you all to carry with you. Most commonly, it's caused from fracture from a long bone like a tibia or a femur, but it also can be caused by multiple things. So burns, crush injuries, if they get wedged in between a tree and a car, um, if they are an IV drug user and they have direct injection of these carcinogenic drugs, into their muscular tissue that can cause compartment syndrome. Um, if they have bad infection that is growing rampant, it can cause a compartment syndrome. 
or even something as simple as putting on a cast or a splint too tight to the point that it restricts blood flow can cause a compartment syndrome. Um, so all of these things can lead to this really emergent presentation. And it's something that's important because you can't miss it. Because if you miss it, you don't treat the patient, then they're gonna lose that extremity. All right, so sorry, five minutes over time. What oh, questions do y'all have? Great, this was awesome. Do you guys have any questions about the case study? That was great, Taylor. Thank you, very engaging. Good, I'm glad. Someone asked, do patients get regular blood tests to check for infection when the incision is left open? You mean like the CDC or to check this? Because you can check for them to see an infection, you know, just assessing the wound or, or the incision site too. Absolutely. And that's a great point. Sometimes we can learn a lot about a patient, not from a lab test, but by just looking at them. Do they look sick? Are they running a fever? Does their wound look infected? Does it have discoloration? Is it draining pus or purulent type material? Um, but yes, if I'm really concerned, I will get a CVC. But you can also gain a lot just from looking at vital signs in the patient. Right, right, right. Do you guys have any other questions about the case study? Do fasciotomies have to be performed by ortho? Um, oftentimes, if a trauma center does have um, orthopedic trauma, they will be done by ortho. But you will also see that vascular surgeons will do um, fasciotomies as well. Answer one or two more questions. If you guys have any more before we go. Oh, in the Q&A. Oh, I, we basically already answered this. Does acute compartment syndrome have bad outcomes usually? It can if you miss it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a limb. Um, um, one good question was that I saw come through is how do you treat the tibia fracture? So oftentimes um, it'll be treated at the same time as the fasciotomy or a few days later if it's stable. Um, but treatment for a tibia fracture is most of the time a rod inside of the bone to hold it into alignment. Thank you so much. Um, another question, how does the PA, it's about the, I guess your profession as a whole, um, General, but how does the PA profession differ from a physician? How does that apply to you? Yeah, um, so that's a big question. Um, in general, um, PAs do a lot of what physicians will do depending on specialty. I will say that if you are an individual that needs to be a surgeon, making the final call on a surgical procedure to be done, um, that's something that is more in the line of the physician. Um, as opposed to if you are wanting to, from a surgical perspective at least, be the supportive care and the stabilization before and after surgery and provide assistance during surgery, then the PA route is the way to go. Um, I would say the biggest benefit um, or perk that I had see of being a PA, um, specifically working in a surgical specialty, is that I always have multiple people on my team to be able to ask for help. Um, so I know a lot, but I also know when I've reached my knowledge limit, and it's nice to know that I have a physician and other colleagues to back me up whenever I've reached my knowledge limit to kind of take it from there and helping me care for the patient. Right, right, yes, teamwork. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So I'm gonna let you go. Um, Taylor, I know we, is there a way to, um, I was just reading the comments. Okay, yeah, because um, it's 810. I don't want to keep you too much longer. So um, thank you. Thank you so, so, so much for coming on and for doing the amazing case study, telling us more about your journey. So thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Thank you, Taylor. So guys, I'll see you guys next Monday. Have a great week, guys. Thank you again, Taylor.
right, bye everyone. Bye.